Hello. We turn now in the last lecture of the semester to Acts 2 and 3 of Playboy of the Western World. When I ended my consideration of the first act of Playboy on Friday, I had been discussing Christy Mahomes' transformation after his arrival at the remote pub owned by Michael Flaherty and run by his tempestuous daughter, Peggy, a young woman of passion and imagination who is clearly meant for better things. Well, before uh, moving on to Act 2 and 3, uh, let me summarize where we have come thus far. Christie has fled from his father's small farm in the southern part of Ireland, and he has been on the road by the opening of the play for several days, hiding from the law and sleeping in ditches. When he arrives in the godforsaken hamlet on the wild west coast of County Mayo, where the play is set, I noted that when Christie enters the pub, he believes that he is a renegade from justice because he thinks that it has actually killed his tyrannical, drunken father with a farm implement and that the law is surely pursuing him. Well, given his imagined status as a fugitive, Christie is surprised at the warm reception he receives when Michael and his boozing buddies Jimmy and Philly, uh, and later the initial, uh, initially skeptical Peggy, um, all respond to him with fascination. Uh, he is a mysterious novelty in a village so isolated and tiny that Pegine's only marriage option seems to be her cowardly second cousin, Sean, a local laughingstock who's so obedient to the local priest that he'll marry her, Pegine, only after Father Riley has obtained a special dispensation from the Pope allowing blood relations to wed. Christie quickly senses that his listeners are sympathetic to his status as a would-be criminal and that they hate and distrust the local British police force, the so-called peelers, whom he fears are after him. So Christie milks their curiosity and finds that they embrace him even more warmly when he confesses that the crime he committed wasn't larceny or forgery, but rather patricide, the killing of his own father, or so he imagines. The play's darkest irony in Singh's evocation of the Irish character is that the idea of murder could turn a timorous refugee into a local celebrity, into someone admired and trusted because of that reputation for a violent deed. Jimmy suggests that, indeed, Michael hire Christie as his pub boy, and Christie, of course, likes the idea. Um, when Michael uh, hears this, he too finds that it is an idea worth considering. Well, Pegine is enchanted with the idea of a young man who slew his da after her initial skepticism. She sees Christie then as the embodiment of her dreams, a romantic hero who has done a daring deed, but who speaks of himself and of her like a kind of lyric poet. He is, to Pegin's imagination, an irresistible combination of warrior, lover, and poet. Everything that the cringing, fearful Sean is not. Now, I noted um, that the comical but perverse local celebration of Christie as a father slayer uh, is one that the entire community shares in. Uh, the widow Quinn and the village girls later do so. But I noted that this celebrity can be explained only by the oppressed Irish condition um, that we see here. Um, they approve of anyone, these Irish rural dwellers, of anyone who transgresses against oppressive authority. Um, this is, remember, a people who in 1907, at the time of the play's publication and setting, uh, were subject to the dominance of the British state as a colony and to the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church. And so they feel, most of them, a knee-jerk sympathy for this stranger who strikes out against a domineering figure, especially one described as tyrannical, like Christie's father. Well, after Michael goes off with his friends to get drunk at the wake, Christie is left alone with Peggy and they begin to fall in love with each other. More specifically, 
to fall in love with the ideas that they create for one another and of one another under each other's encouragement. Christie describes Peguin as a kind of rural goddess, different from all the women he's seen along his trek through Ireland as he has been fleeing. It is an image of her that confirm, conforms to Peguin's conception of herself. Um, and in reciprocal fashion, Peguin fashions an image of Christie as a man of distinction, as she puts it, a man who could hold his head up high with the wonders of the world, and of whom she can say, wasn't I telling you that you are a fine, handsome young fellow with a noble brow, to which Christie, with a flash of delighted surprise, says, is it me? <laughs> well, note that Christie's question, is it me, indicates something. Unlike Peguin, he has never before had a self-conception that resembles the ideal that she is presenting to him. Christie doesn't recognize it, even though this image she presents to him of himself delights him. He doesn't recognize it, in short, the way she does, his version of her, which has been essentially for her a long-standing mental image. But Christie is as thrilled by her idea of him as she is by his idea of her. It's clear that part of Peguin's fascination with Christie as an outlaw is rooted in her vicarious identification with his aggression against his father because Peguin clearly resents her own father, Michael, and the life of drudgery and confinement to which he has subjected her. Uh, she is completely isolated. Peguin needs to see Christie as a romantic hero for several reasons, because he's the kind of man she wants to love, because he's the kind of man she feels is worthy of her, and because he's the kind of man she would like to be if she were a man, a man capable of killing his own father. Christie is different from the crude, brawling males who she knows who get drunk perpetually and fight, and certainly also is different from men like Sean, who are afraid of their own shadows. Well, Peguin's need for a heroic alternative to these rather uh, unprepossessing male types explains her refusal to accept Christie's claims that before meeting her, he was actually an obscure outcast in his own village. Christie says, up to the day I killed my father, there wasn't a person in Ireland knew the kind I was, and I there think drinking, waking, eating, sleeping, a quiet, simple, poor fellow with no man giving me heed. Peguin, getting a quilt out of the cupboard and putting it on the rack, says, well, it was the girls were giving you heed, maybe, and I'm a-thinking it's the most conceit you to be gaming with their like. The girls must have been interested in you, know. So Christie says, shaking his head with simplicity, not the girls itself, and I won't tell you a lie, there wasn't anyone heeding me in that place, saving only the dumb beast of the field, sits down by the fire. Peguin, with disappointment, and I thinking you should have been living the like of a king of Norway or of the Eastern world. Note that Peguin is disappointed when, for a moment, uh, Christie, in his self-description, falls beneath the exalted conception he has of him, but she doesn't stay disappointed very long, because Christie almost immediately picks up on her need to glamorize him and his past, and to transform his mundane actions in the past, like poaching, as we saw last time, into romantic nocturnal adventures. This same glamorous rewriting of Christie's past leads him to transform his father under her encouragement from an irascible drunk into a source of terrifying menace, all inflating himself in keeping with her idea of him. Peguin is thrilled by Christie's fabrications, and Christie gradually comes to believe in them himself. Or more particularly, he comes to believe in the truth of Peguin's conception of him as a man of exceptional bravery and romantic charm. Now, their love for one another is so closely connected to their self-images that they can't help, that they help one another believe in and sustain those self-images. It's reciprocal in that regard. 
But I noted that the relationship, as I've described it, raises two intriguing questions. First, to what extent is their love fundamentally narcissistic? Well, do they fall in love more, one might ask, with the constructed idea of the other or with the vision of themselves that the other provides for them? Well, Christie and McGean, as I, Pegin, as I noted last time, function as mirrors for one another in that they see in one another a source of the self that they want to believe in, but they also do love each other for the extraordinary beings that they believe one another to be. So I think we can say then that their love is both narcissistic and reciprocal. This gets at a second psychological question about the relationship. Is their love based on uh, imaginative misrecognition, uh, on a failure to see one another as they really are, or is it based, this love, on a deeper form of recognition, of some form of true perception of each other? Well, put simply, is it possible that the romanticized selves that Pegin and Christie assign to one another and come to believe in themselves that those imaginative constructs prove to be their truest identities and that they realize those true identities only through one another's encouragement. Well, I think that, in fact, that is the case, particularly as we shall see with Christie. Well, the intimate conversation that uh, Christie and Pegin have in Act One is interrupted by the arrival of the widow Quinn. Uh, she has come on this dark night, ostensibly, to bring Christie to her house, uh, since she suggests it would be indecent for him to stay with an unmarried and engaged young, but engaged young woman. But mainly, she has come out of curiosity. She and Pegin don't like each other, and they soon become rivals for Christie. But these antagonists are ironically alike in their first view of him, in that they both respond with a kind of scathing skepticism. In fact, the widow's opening remark is downright castrating. As I noted, when she sees him, she refers to Christie immediately as a little smiling fellow. And Pegin's immediate defense, defense of Christie's manhood is something that she offers both for Christie's sake, but also for her own. Uh, already, a rivalry is established. She will not have the man she loved diminished. Unfortunately for Pegin, the widow has two advantages over her at this point. First, she isn't engaged to Sean, so she is freer then to marry this stranger. And second, in the widow's mind and in the minds of the local girls, she and Christie are especially well suited because they have both committed a murder. As Pegin explained, uh, the widow Quinn killed her husband. Thus, the widow sees them as soulmates and says, quote, there's a great temptation in a man that slay is da. Yes, we're meant for each other. Now, I noted last time that none of the glamour that Christie gains for allegedly killing his father attaches to the widow Quinn for murdering her husband. There are several reasons I noted. First, because this killing did not occur, like Christie's, at a distance that allows the locals to imagine it the way they wish. Um, second, the husband was not killed with a single blow, but rather lingered and got blood poisoning uh, in a way that seemed uh, rather grotesque and anticlimactic. And finally, remember, the widow Quinn is a woman, and that makes killing a male a source more of fear than admiration within the male community. Violence is supposed to be, traditionally, the province of men, not women. And the widow Quinn also fills the local men with a certain fear because of her reputation as a witch, a view steeped in local folk myths. It's interesting, I noted, that the widow doesn't try to deny these accusations, such as Pegin's claim that she suckled a black ram at her breast, because she knows that her reputation is a source of fear and thus the only source of power she has as a woman within the community. And that explains why the village girls, Sarah and others, seem to support her, uh, look at her almost as a kind of role model. But the widow uh, might also deny uh, Pegin's, uh, refuse to deny Pegin's accusations about her dark powers in suckling this ram because she senses that her reputation for dominance and violence and dark magic that disturbs the local men 
actually intrigues and attracts Christy. Indeed, it seems too, because in Act 2, we see him sitting in the widow's lap and entwining his arms with her as they drink at the girl's instigation. Now, apart from their reputation as killers of men, another thing that Christy and the widow share is a complete lack of remorse, a shocking lack of remorse for the deeds that they have committed. Well, Pegin is sufficiently threatened by the widow Quinn's appeal to Christy to come with her, and by Christie's apparent interest in the widow Quinn, that at the end of Act One, Pegin tells uh, Christy that she won't marry Sean, and that she wouldn't marry Sean even if the bishop came walking in that very moment. Now, the Dublin audience, of course, in 1907, regarded lines such as this as direct attacks upon the clergy. And Singh certainly knew that Christie's darkly hilarious remark at the end of Act One would agitate the crowd even more. You remember as he settles into the bed that Pegin has made up for him, the first time he slept in a bed in well over a week, reflecting on the fact that he has two fine women vying for his affections, he concludes that if he'd known that, he would have killed his father years earlier. All right, let's turn now to Act Two which opens the next morning. Christie is still talking to himself, as we saw him talking to himself at the end of Act One, this time, though, in a longer soliloquy. And as he speaks to himself, he is cleaning Pegin's boots and then gazing into a mirror. Let's consider. He thinks to himself, well, it's a clean bed and soft, okay? And when he wakes up from the brilliant morning, cleaning the girl's boots, um, he takes particular interest. There's her boots now, Pegin's. How nice and decent for her evening use. And isn't it grand brushes she has? He puts them down and goes by degrees to the looking glass. Well, this would be a fine place to be my whole life talking with, swear, with, with swearing Christians takes up the looking glass from the wall and puts it on the back of a chair and then sits down in front of it and begins washing his face. Didn't I know rightly I was handsome, though it was the devil's own mirror we had beyond would twist a squint across an angel's brow, and I'll be growing fine from this day the way I have a soft, lovely skin on me and won't be the like of the clumsy young fellows do be plowing at all times in the earth and in the dung. Okay. Now, you'll note that we see Christie here in a process, as he gazes into the mirror, of reconceiving himself in accordance with that figure that Pegin uh, had described to him and that the village uh, had uh, projected upon him uh, when um, he entered. That conception of him now as somehow heroic and rare is an idea of himself that he is embracing as he gazed into the mirror as true. As he looks at himself in the looking glass, we reminded, of course, he's reminded that the only other images of himself he's seen were uh, in a, uh, a looking glass back at his father's house, which was so corroded uh, that it distorted his image, and he never seemed to have a clear impression of what he actually looked like. Now, however, he looks in the mirror an actual looking glass, and sees the heroic self that he believes he really is, or at least is in the process of becoming. That heroic self that Pegin in particular has described him as. Now, you'll remember in Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, we also um, noted the way in which identities can be fabricated. But for Wilde, those identities were all inventions. None of them were true because there isn't an underlying self to discover. But for Singh, there is. And the ad adoption of masks, the act of pretending to be someone or something, can paradoxically reveal that the mask we wear or the role we play releases or expresses an authentic self within that in Christie's case he never knew was there but feels he recognizes it when he hears it described and when he sees it. This is the case with him, the truth of masks, if you will. The mirror he holds in his hand, as he uh, puts on the chair and looks into, recalls, of course, the way in which in the previous night, Pegin had been his 
uh, figurative mirror. He had seen himself uh, uh, reflected uh, in, a, uh, uh, in an admirable and desirable way in her dashing portrait of him, in that construction, okay? And with that in mind, he now sees that as he looks at himself in the mirror and sees a finer individual than he ever th knew existed. Now, there's a part of the underlying identity that Christie is discovering in this new place that goes beyond the masculine model that Peggine had adumbrated for him, the model of the lover-warrior-poet. Because what Singh reveals in this soliloquy at the beginning of Act Two is Christie's fascination with something else in himself, with what I think we can only describe as a kind of feminine side. He's attracted, you remember, when he looks at them, to Peggy's little boots, this man who we're told has little feet himself. And he is fascinated by her hairbrushes. He likes the idea, as he looks in the mirror, of his soft, lovely skin. And he preens before the looking glass in a way usually associated with women. Now, it is narcissistic in that uh, Christie is fascinated with his new self-conception, but it's a self-conception that seems to blend the masculine and the feminine, um, but one which nonetheless he sees fundamentally as genuine in this composite. Christie knows that he needs to balance these male and female aspects of himself, and he knows in particular that he must not appear outwardly feminine to others. So, when Sarah and Nellie and Susan, the local village girls, come in, um, Christy immediately tries to hide the mirror. And Sarah says, I've never seen a man holding a looking glass to his back before. He doesn't really fool them. Well, to compensate for this uh, feminine behavior, uh, knowing uh, that the town conceives of him as a man who killed his father, Christie has to stress for these girls his virility by bragging and exaggerating about the slaying of his da, uh, a man who we now learn tried to force Christie to marry a dreadful old woman. And it was this indignity, or the argument that followed this indignity, uh, this demand from the father that precipitated um, Christie's attack. Christie says, there I was digging and digging. And he comes up and he says, you squittin' idiot. Let you walk down now and tell the priest you'll wed the widow Casey in a score of days. And it turns out that the widow Casey was a walk in terror from beyond the hills. And she two score in five years and two hundred weights and five pounds and weighing scales with a limping leg. All right, so she's 45 years old with a limp and she's overweight and also one-eyed. She has a blinded eyeball. This does not make her particularly appealing. But Christie goes on that um, the reason the father wanted him to marry her was for his own profit. He was letting on I was wanting a protector from the harshness of the world, and he without a thought the whole while, but how he'd have her hut to live in and her gold to drink. Uh, she would be able to subsidize uh, Christie's father's alcoholism. To which Christie said, I... I won't wet her, says I, when all know she did suckle me for six weeks when I come into the world. Hmm. Christie goes on when uh, the father says, she's too good then for the likes of you, says he, and go now or I'll flatten you out with a cry like a crawling beast has passed under a dray. To which Christie says he responded, You will not if I can help it, says I. Go on, says he. I'll have the devil making garters of your limbs tonight, says he. Well, you'll not if I can help it, says I. And I lifted up, brandishing my mug, brandishing it up before his mug, the farm implement, the loy. And, th and then Christie observes, With that the sun came out between the cloud and the hill, and it's shining green on my face. God have mercy on your soul, says he, lifting a sky, and on yours, said I, raising the loy, and it came down on his head. That's a grand story. Well, it's a story that is no doubt um, uh, in many ways gilded by Christie's uh, need to present his own heroism here. But note a couple of things about it. In this account for the girls, Christie casts himself as a defiant 
son, but also as a defiant heterosexual male, okay? Now, it's true enough that he is powerfully attracted both to Pegin and the widow Quinn, though in different ways. Uh, in Pegin, Christie saw and st still sees uh, an Irish goddess, uh, whereas on the widow Quinn, he sees a source of dangerous, erotic fascination, and possibly in the widow Quinn, he could also be drawn to her as a kind of mother figure. Remember, Christie's own mother seems to have died shortly after his birth, when he was in infancy, um, and possibly, in fact, in giving birth to him. And note that he has already heard this curious tale about the widow Quinn suckling a ram at her own breast. However, obviously, if he is drawn to the widow Quinn in part uh, out of a sort of maternal attraction, he was not drawn uh, to the maternal attraction of this old woman that his father had selected for him so that he could live in her house and help acquire her wealth. No, what's notable is that when, Ch when um, Christie uh, refuses, he, he told his father that she nursed me as an infant at her own breast. And the idea then of marrying and coupling with this older woman who had suckled him as a mother uh, fills Christie with a sense of, 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 of disgust, of, of revulsion. Somehow, um, it's a little bit too close. Uh, the idea of the widow Quinn as a maternal figure is one thing, but when you are, in fact, being asked to marry the woman who has suckled you, and an old and ugly one at that, no, there's no appeal in that. Now, note that Singh is here playing with the concept of the Oedipal complex that Freud developed uh, in 1899, just a few years before Singh began drafting this play. The idea that uh, a young child is in competition with his father for the erotic uh, possession of the mother and that the young child wishes sexual union with the mother and wishes secretly to kill the father. Now, the idea that a son wants to kill his father in this play certainly holds true with Christie, that aspect of the Oedipalized situation, but um, the idea of incestuous union with a woman who nurses you like a mother fills him with revulsion, at least in the woman his father wants him to marry, though not necessarily in the widow Quinn. The widow, by contrast, may hold a certain maternal appeal, but without that direct incestuous complication. Now, the scene with these girls is full of other psychosexual complexities that Singh is exploring. Just as we saw that Christie is fascinated with Pegin's boots and with her brushes, and essentially uh, revealing a kind of feminized aspect of his own nature, the girls, on the other hand, look at um, Christie's boots uh, while he is out for a moment and fetishize them, these battered male boots. In fact, Sarah puts one of them on because it represents to her all the things that women can't do, like traveling outside their own hamlet, like taking violent action. It's as if um, the boots and all of the stains and all of the mud somehow bear witness to a fascinating life that they would like to know. So Sarah picks up the boot and sniffs it um, and smiles and says, that's bog water, I'm thinking, but it's his own, they are surely, for I never seen the like of them for whitey mud and red mud and turf on them and the fine sands of the sea. That man's been a walking, I'm telling you. And she goes right down, she goes down right, putting on one of his boots. Sarah seems to be interested in doing this, in learning or discovering what it would be like to be a man, to be somehow a man who has walked a great distance, who has somehow explored the world a little bit. She wants to know what it would be like to be a man when she puts on Tr Christie's boots, just as, just as Christie seems to be curious about what it would be like to be a female with these brushes for one's hair and these dainty little shoes. And indeed, in this scene, even as he tries to assert his virility, Christie is feminized in that he allows himself to be maneuvered physically by these girls, this uh, teenage trio who have come bearing gifts. 
um, will uh, essentially um, move him physically uh, toward the widow Quinn um, uh, in a way that, that seems to undercut uh, the assertions of his own power as a male. But note that the trio has come bearing gifts, including duck eggs and butter. This is a clear parody of the visit of the Magi, okay? One of several religious parodies, as we'll see in this play. And another bit of sacrilegious satire that was designed to agitate Singh's Dublin audience, and it did. Now, why do these young girls, these teenage girls, want Christie to marry the widow Quinn so much that they position him on her lap, and then make the couple entwine their arms and arrange this toast to their union? Why, in short, do they prefer the widow Quinn to Pegeen, um, who um, she, you know, even after Pegeen insists that she is no longer engaged to Sean? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. First, they identify more with the widow Quinn um, because they seek through her the vicarious experience of possessing Christie as a lover and as the adventurer that he represents, um, but they're also titillated at the idea of these two man killers, the widow and Christie, coming together. And finally, the girls may prefer the widow Quinn because they represent because they resent Pegine. Uh, after all, she looks down on them and distrusts them. When she comes in and finds them there, she refers to them as a pack of wild girls and suggests that they might whisper local secrets to the police at night and incriminate Christy. Indeed, when Pegine comes in and finds the girl and the widow Quinn in her pub with Christy, she feels that he has betrayed her. In retaliation, she warns Christy that the girls could expose him to the police who would likely lynch him, quote, in a half hour of great anguish. Well, what is it that allows Pegine then to restore her ideal conception of Christy after this momentary disillusionment? Two things. First, Christy flatters her beauty almost immediately in a lyrical language that he knows she finds irresistible because it confirms or conforms to Pegine's idea of herself as a woman of special beauty and conforms to her idea of him as a man of extraordinary poetic sensitivity. Christie says, How would a lovely, handsome woman like you be lonesome when all the men should be thronging around to hear the sweetness of your voice and the little infant children should be pestering your steps, I'm thinking, and you walk in the roads. Okay, he knows exactly how to appeal to her. Second, she is quick to forgive him and to reconstitute her idealized conception of him because the two of them make a more authentic connection they discover that what they share most of all is loneliness. Both have grown up without mothers. Uh, Peggyn says, in fact, I'm my whole life with my father only. And when Christie tells her of his isolation on the road and his isolation in the village where he lived before that, she's moved, moved enough to describe her own. And this leads Christie then to tell her I was lonesome all times and born lonesome. Well, in this intimate disclosure on each side, Pegine and Christie discover that they could be then the cure for each other's painful solitude. Pegine uh, observes that um, the, uh, the body of the father who she thinks Christie is buried is never likely to be found, so they're safe. And Christie then says, yes, yes, following her with fearful joy, so I can stay so, working at your side, and I not lonesome from this mortal day. Christie adds, and I'll have your words from this day fill in my ears, right here in the pub, 
To which Pegin says, I'm thinking you'll be a loyal young lad to have working around. Now, the words that they exchange here almost constitute a kind of exchange of vows. But at this moment, the widow Quinn re-enters with Sean, who is always, of course, a reliable source of comedy in this play. Knowing that he has been displaced, Sean tries to bribe Christy to go away after Pegine goes out by presenting uh, Christy with a one-way ticket to America and some fine clothing. Christy tries on the suit that uh, Sean offers him as a tempter, and again, he preens before the mirror because the clean clothes confirm to his new, elevated, elegant idea of himself. But he refuses unmistakably Sean's bribe. Christy, preening proud as a peacock, says, nonetheless, I'm not going to America. If this is a poor place itself, I'll make myself contented to be lodging here. And he adds, I'm going out now on the hillside to seek Pagin. Well, Christie at this point would prefer to be the hero of this small western world of County Mayo than sail to the real western world of America. Sean confides to the widow Quinn that he would be eager to betray Christie to the police, to the peelers, if only he, Sean, weren't afraid that Christie would find out, quote, and destroy me before the authorities could arrest Christie. The widow, who wants Christie for herself, knows how to manipulate and exploit poor, cowardly Sean. She says she'll wed Christy and thereby restore Pegine to him, to Sean, on a condition. If Sean will give her, in exchange for doing that, a red cow and a mountain ram. Essentially, the widow Quinn makes Sean pay for what she wants anyway. Now, at this moment, when Christy seems most triumphant or at least to this point most triumphant, the play's central comic reversal occurs. As Christie is bragging about his status as the toast of the community, in a fit of hubris, he suddenly spots his father through the window and blurts out to the widow Quinn the following. Christie says, from this on out, I'll have no want of company when all sorts is bringing me their food and clothing. He swaggers to the door, tightening his belt. The way they'd set their eyes upon a gallant orphan, cleft his father with one blow to the breeches belt. Note how the act of killing the father becomes more and more exaggerated and heroic. He opens the door and then staggers back. Saints of glory, holy angels from the throne of light. Widow Quinn, well, what ails you? It's the walking spirit of my murdered da. Widow Quinn looking out. Is that the trapper? Christy wildly. Where will I hide my poor body from the ghost of hell? The door is pushed open and old Mahan appears on the threshold. Christy darts behind the door so that Mahan can't see him. Um, Christy's terror and need to hide has a double cause. First, he fears that it really is a ghost because um, he's convinced that the, uh, the blow to the father's head must have killed him. But he also um, is terrified because it's a knee-jerk reaction to his domineering father that is probably uh, the repetition of things he did hundreds of times cowering before the father in years gone by. Well, in revealing this instinctive fear to the widow, Christy retreats from the brave, rebellious self that he had come to believe in and that the community, and most of all, Pegin believe in. Consider the old man Mahan's words when he enters. I want to, <clears throat> Mahan enters and says, I want to destroy my son for breaking the head on me with the clout of alloy. He takes off a big hat and shows his head in a mass of bandages and plaster with some pride. It was he did that, and I'm to great wonder to think I've traced him ten days with that rent in my crown. Yeah, it was my own son hit me, and he the devil or robber or anything else but a dirty, sputtering lout. Yeah, okay. Now, note that just as Christy did when he arrived in Act 1, Old Mahan milks listeners and milks public opinion um, by describing what he has been through. Not just does he brag about 
what he's going to do. I'll destroy him as a potential enactor of violence, but he also milks a certain kind of admiration by playing the role of one who has miraculously survived an act of violence against him by showing off the head wound with all of this blood and bandages with a sense of pride, even as he's seeking revenge against his son. Thus, um, he presents himself both as a, a kind of uh, uh, avenging force and also as one who has uh, somehow survived a violent attack. He knows that the story behind these things will fascinate people. Ironically then, like Christie, Mahan is a performer who along the road has benefited for 10 days from telling people about this encounter with his son and, like Christie, almost certainly exaggerating it for his own benefit. Nonetheless, what he describes he calls the naked truth. For example, when Philly asks, and what way was it done, this encounter? Mahan wandering about the room. I'm um, after walking hundreds and long scores of miles, winning clean beds and the fill of my belly four times in a day, and I'm doing nothing but telling stories of that naked truth. Yeah, He acknowledges that he has exploited uh, this story, but he still calls it the naked truth, much as, Shaw, as uh, Christie believes in his own exaggerations. Thus, the father and son have more in common than either of them realize. Both of them milk the curiosity of their listeners and benefit from it. They both win sympathy and admiration. They both win free food and drinks um, in their travels. Um, and they both do it in a way on the road that they never could at home. Because, in fact, at home they were both laughing stocks. The father, a cantankerous, alcoholic old coot. And the son, a timorous fellow who was afraid even to look at local women who laughed at him behind, their, behind his back. Now, if you can imagine this scene of Mahan's appearance on stage, you will realize that there are several sources of comedy. First, there's the drastic reversal in fortunes itself. Christie, the man who has bragged about striking down this monstrous tyrant who becomes more magnified in his villainy with each retelling, now behaves more like Sean by retreating and hiding like a coward when he spots this battered old man out the window. A second source of comedy is the dramatic irony. Mahan is unaware that his son, this figure he's seeking, is concealed nearby, hiding in fact in the same room but behind a barrier and can hear everything that he is saying. But the third and greatest source of comedy here is what Mahan says about Christie, which completely subverts the persona of the violent romantic hero that Christie has developed and milked and celebrated since his arrival, an identity that he has been born in collaboration not just with the community, but specifically with Peggy. But now the father says, that uh, tells the widow Quinn back home, well, um, he was a talker of folly, a man you'd see stretched the half of the day in the brown ferns on his belly in the sun, lazy, doing nothing. Oh, he'd be fooling a little bit about with the birds. He had finches and, and felt, or making mugs at his own self in that bit of glass we hung on the wall. Even then, he was sort of fascinated with his own image, but he couldn't really see it very well. And then he says, running wild? Ah, no. If he'd seen a red petticoat, my son, coming swinging over the hill, he'd be off to hide in the sticks, and you'd see him shooting out his sheep's eyes between the little twigs of the leaves and the two ears rising up like a hare, looking out through the gap. Girls indeed. No, he was terrified of girls. You ran from them. Oh, and he'd had a queer rotten stomach too, I'm telling you. And when I'd give him three pulls on my pipe a while since, he was taken with contortions till I could send him in the ass cart to the female's nurse. Hmm. Finally, Mahung concludes, wasn't he the laugh and joke of every female woman where four baronies meet the way the girls would stop their weedin' if they'd seen him coming on the road and let roar at him and call him the loony of the Mahans? Whoa. Well, you'll note that their words here almost uh, constitute what reported here a kind of a kind of <laughs> castration 
in every conceivable way. Uh, the Christie Mahon uh, that his father describes here to the widow Quinn is passive, timorous, indolent, narcissistic, absolutely afraid of women, and largely incapable of work. In short, everything about him here seems unmanly. So unmanly, in fact, that he not only uh, hides from women, but when he is given a pipe to smoke by his father, um, that too is beyond him. Um, remember that the pipe is a kind of quintessential phallic object, uh, a, uh, a token of, of masculinity and homosocial life, um, and smoking it is then a, a rite of passage for a young man in immaturity. But Mahone says that after a few puffs, um, Christie would get faint and sick, and they'd have to cart him off um, in, a, in a dung cart. Now, this is the past that Christie has been trying to live down. It was a life in which he was more than just lonely, as he told Pegin. It was a life in which he was weak and ridiculous. It was shameful. Well, consider the widow Quinn's interesting position as she hears this amazing testimony from Mahone with Christie hiding and listening. The widow has the power to expose Christie here because she now knows the truth. She knows that he only ineffectually wounded his father, that he didn't kill him. She knows that he was a milk toast and a laughing stock before he ever arrived. And she knows that his bragging claim of killing his father was not just a falsehood, but one that he exaggerated. But how can she exploit this knowledge to her benefit? Well, she protects Christie when she sends Mahone off to catch a steamer, telling him that will lead her lead Mahone to the figure that has passed through. But then having protected him, or tried in some way uh, to separate the father from him, the widow then mocks and emasculates Christie in order to demonstrate her power over him. When Christie sees uh, here's uh, Mahon go out abruptly. The widow swings the door to and looks at Christy, who is cowering in terror for a moment, and then she bursts into a laugh. Well, you're the walking playboy of the Western world, and that's the poor man you had divided to the breeches with a belt. <laughs> you little schemer, you've been making up a story you destroyed your da. Christy tried to defend himself that... Uh, uh, to be letting he was dead, letting on he was dead, and coming back to life then, and following after me like an old weasel, tracing a rat, and coming in here and laying desolation between my own self and the fine women of Ireland, and he a kind of carcass that you'd just want to fling into the sea. Oh, there he is now, Christie says, looking out the window, crossing the strands, and that the Lord God would send a high wave to wash over him and take him from the world. The widow Quinn is even astonished at this, she says, scandalized. Have you no shame? Well, let us consider this for a moment. What's curious and horrifying here is Christie's response as he looks out at his father going off down the beach toward the steamer he hopes to catch. Instead of feeling relief at the discovery that he's not a murderer, Christie feels only regret that the old man didn't die. Uh, he almost feels in some way uh, a sense of indignant betrayal that the old man somehow managed to live and feels then resentment that he has followed Christie and is now threatening this new life and new self-conception. How dare he? I wish a big wave would wash him from the world. <laughs> well, there is no sense of relief at discovering he's not a murderer because there was never any sense of guilt in Christie. And the widow Quinn, even she who has so little sense of remorse over killing her husband, even she is shocked at this when she says, have you no shame? Well, Christie confesses that his greatest fear here isn't exposure before the men of the village, but rather the loss of esteem in Pegin's eyes. That's what terrifies him. That's what he's really afraid of. When he speaks of uh, 
Peguin, it is in, in a language so exalted um, that it makes it clear that he could not bear to fall below her conception of him. It's her, like is fitted to be handling merchandise in the heavens above. And what'll I be doing now, I ask you? And I, a kind of wonder, was jilted by the heavens when day was by. Yeah. To imagine that this exalted woman believes in me, okay? And now it may all be threatened. Um, well, note that it is principally through Peguin that he has come to conceive of himself as a romantic hero, and thus he fears, quote, she'll be turning again and speaking hard words to me if and when she finds out that unknowingly I perpetuated a fraud. Well, when the widow mocks um, Christie's exultation of Peguin and calls it just poetry talk, poetry talk for a barmaid, Peggy Christie says that indeed, no, that's not right. Peggyne is fitted to be handling the merchandise in the heavens, not just um, uh, pints of, of, of booze here in the pub. You don't understand. In response to this, the widow tries to lure Christie to her, to lure him to a life with her um, in what she calls a life of whispering and hugging in my little house scene. Uh, promising to protect his reputation there as a man-killer, not to expose him, um, but also suggesting that if you come and live with me, presumably marry me, what we will have there also is a life in which um, we can share, uh, a life in which we may be isolated from the rest of the community, um, but in which we will be together a life of solitude um, from others, but not from one another, because it is a life of solitude and a sense of difference from those around them that she suggests she and um, uh, Christy both share. But this loneliness and sense of difference are also, after all, what Christy and Peggyne share and that they had um, described in solidifying their love for one another. Thus, Christie rejects the widow Quinn's seductive offer, and he not only makes it clear that he prefers Peguin, but he goes so far in his devotion to Peguin to ask for the widow's help in winning Peguin, the widow Quinn's rival. He says, it's herself only that I am seeking now, and adds, Will you swear to aid me and save me for the love of Christ? That is, he asked the widow Quinn, will you help me conceal the truth that you now know? Well, the widow Quinn holds the cards here, which makes us wonder, why does she choose now um, to support him? Well, although the widow Quinn offers Christie security, she knows that there are things that Peguin can offer him that she cannot, and so she stops in this moment um, competing in that respect. Um, unlike Peguin, the widow doesn't reinforce Christie's idea of himself, nor could she at this point, because she has seen, in fact, him cower before a living father. And this helps to explain why Christie makes the choice so easily for Peguin. Peguin believes in him still, believes in the self Christie wants to believe in himself, whereas the widow Quinn can't. And Christie does not want, quite apart from other considerations, um, to be with or live with a woman who has seen him so humiliated. But the question then is, if she once then needs to be with Peguin because he loves her and because um, he loves her idea of him. Why does the widow agree to this? She says, okay, I will keep your secret. I will support you. Uh, but in exchange, I want a ram and a load of dung in return. Well, as we saw in her exchange with Sean, the widow Quinn is driven partly by a desire for profit. She drives a hard bargain. But she agrees to protect and even support Christie's pursuit of Peguin 
for another more important reason, and that is the widow suspects that despite her help in keeping Christie's secret and in sending Mahone away, that the truth eventually will come out, and that when the truth comes out, Peggyn will reject Christie, as she does, and that then she, the widow Quinn, will be able to marry him anyway. In fact, the widow predicts this after she, after Christie leaves at the end of Act Three, Act, of Act Two, when speaking to herself in a little soliloquy, she says, "Well, if the worst comes in the end of all." It'll be great game to see there's none to pity him but a widow woman. The like of me has buried her children and destroyed her man. She sees a time when the only option, as she imagines it, in the community will be a life with her. When somehow, not through her, but through other means, the truth that he is not a docular comes out. All right. Well, Nonetheless, inspired and reassured by the widow's promise, Christy goes off to the sporting games that are taking place down below on the shore. He's filled with a belief that he is capable of rising above his humiliating past, and he believes that the um, vestiges of those past have disappeared along with his father, whom he saw going off. As Christy wins the events in this kind of rural Olympiad, he earns the title now of the playboy of the Western world, a phrase that the widow Quinn had used earlier, but which now he lives up to legitimately. Now, there are several meanings to that term playboy built into it. First of all, one of the meanings it had, certainly at the turn of the century, was a sportsman. Christie is here a sportsman, a player who wins all of the, all of the uh, competitions, including the mule race. He discovers that he excels at these masculine pastimes. A second meaning of playboy, though, is the more familiar one that is associated with sexual potency and romance. Um, Christie is the object of female desire, and his exploits down below establish, solidify, uh, solidify uh, that uh, status that he has of an object of desire, an irresistible uh, male in the eyes of every woman and girl around. And finally, he is a playboy here in another sense, in a kind of play on words, and that is he is a boy, if you will, still playing out a glamorous role, that of father killer, okay? And that proves to be the problem. Christie is again guilty of hubris, even more so at this moment, because as he enacts the role of hero, which may be an authentic part of him, he's denying completely um, the presence of his father and the fact that he did not actually kill him. Thus, he's seized by a kind of overzealous prize, pride. As he wins various competitions, he continues to brag about killing the father, who he knows now very well is quite alive and walking. Now, Singh draws on a convention of tragedy here, because we know from uh, reading tragedy that this kind of overweening pride usually reaches its apex just before a fall is to occur. That's the nature of hubris. We saw it in Clytemnestra when she thought that Orestes was dead. We saw it in Jason when he thought that he had found a way to send Medea away both congratulating themselves, both feeling secure just before their undoing. Sing plays on this. Now, looking down on the action taking place on the shore, up from the pub, Jimmy and Philly um, report on it uh, from this uh, distance. Uh, and Jimmy, enthralled, says, he after bringing bankrupt ruin to the roulette man, okay, in, in the games of chance and the roulette, yeah, lucky, Lucky Christie won that. And the trick of the loop man, yeah, that was another game. Uh, uh, you had to guess the center loop in a little leather belt. And uh, uh, he won that one. And he won at the cock shot uh, in which uh, a man with his face blackened except one cheek and eye standing uh, shoots of, of a wooden ball behind a board with a large hole in it. These are like arcade games, okay? So he's great at those. 
but more than that, we're told he's winning all the sports, the leaping and the, uh, and the racing and the dancing and Lord knows what. All of these games of chance, all of these running and jumping uh, events all lead up to the grand uh, finale, which is the, the donkey race. But as Jimmy celebrates this remarkable series of triumphs, Philly, more skeptically, says yes, yes, and he's not able to say 10 words without making a brag of the way he killed his father and the great blow he hit him with the loy. Note that Philly here injects the first sense of skepticism coming from the male community, a sense of uh, not distrust, but of irritation at uh, what seems to be a kind of uh, unnecessary um, self-congratulation on Christie's part, and even perhaps a slight sense that he might not only be milking this, but perhaps exaggerating it a bit. Now, before long, the Widow Quinn encounters Mahan coming back to the pub where she is by herself. He has not caught the steamer. He's missed it. Well, nonetheless, good to her word, the widow protects Christie here. First, she tells Mahan that uh, he is insane and, and confused by his head wound, um, and that, therefore, the story he says he has heard about Christie uh, as... as uh, having come to the community, cannot possibly be true. No. Unfortunately, however, as Mahan looks down on the mule race, he sees Christie um, as he sits in the, uh, in the pub. Um, um, the widow says, aren't you after saying that your son's a fool and how would they be cheering a true idiot born? Mahan getting distressed. It's maybe then out of reason. That's the man himself. No, can't be him. Cheering again. There's no, none surely go on cheering him. Oh, I'm raving with a madness then that would, would fright the world. Mahan sits down with his hands over his head. There was one time I seen ten scarlet devils sitting on they'd cork my spirit in a gallon can, and one time I seen as big a rats as badgers sacking the lifeblood from the butt of my lung, and I never till this day confused it with that dribbling idiot with a liking man. I'm destroyed, surely. Now, this comes, this suggestion that, um, yes, I must be delirious from drink. I must be seeing things. The Widow Quinn convinces or tries to convince Mahan of this only after when Mahan looks down and sees this figure who is being cheered, he says, why, that's, they're raising him up. They're coming this way. And then with a roar of rage and astonishment, it's Christie by the stars of God. I know his way of spitting and he's astride the moon. I recognize my son. When the widow Quinn says, no, it couldn't possibly be. You've told me your son was a complete milk toast. Not possible. You, you must be delirious. You must be seeing things from drink and being hit over the head. And Mahan, for a time, agrees with her, uh, describing all of the badgers and uh, things that he has seen when he was absolutely intoxicated. Now, you'll note that the trope of the alcohol-infused hallucination is part of the Irish stereotype that Singh's audience objected to. Well, when Mohan, Mohan leaves the pub, now convinced that it could not have really been Christie, even though his eyes seem to suggest it was. When he leaves, Christie enters triumphant, and he enters with Pegin. He is now bragging even more about his bravery, but also lavishing on Pegin the praise of the warrior poet that she adores. He calls Pegin now his Helen of Troy, and he feels that he is himself now an epic hero, and he's proven it. He's won the prizes down on the shore, and she, he says, Pegin, is the ultimate prize that he seeks, that he thinks he deserves, and that he feels he is now about to possess. Christie, taking the prizes from the men, says, thank you kindly, the lot of you, but you'd say it was little only I did this day if you'd seen me a while since striking my one single blow when I killed my da. What Christie knows now is a complete lie, but still using it to magnify himself. Christie goes on, I'll have a great times if I win the crowning prize, though, that I'm seeking now, and that's your promise, Pegin, that you'll wed me in a fortnight when our bands is called. He goes on, 
And then when we're wed, you'll feel my two hands stretched upon you and I squeezing kisses on your puckered lips till I'd feel a kind of pity for the Lord God in all ages sitting lonesome in his golden chair. And he adds, Ah, and there we are, making mighty kisses with our wetted mouths, or gaming in a gap of sunshine with yourself, stretched back unto your necklace and the flowers of the earth. Oh, Lady Helen of Troy, this is irresistible, erotic, evocative, lyric language that celebrates Pegin more profoundly than even she might have imagined. It goes to and beyond her most idealized self-conception. Well, note that Christie's language is never more passionate and lyrical than this, as he exalts Pegin and confirms for her the idea that we had seen her in some way uh, trying to cultivate for herself uh, at the beginning when she ordered fine clothes for her wedding. Now she feels she can wear those gowns uh, to marry a man who befits her natural elegance and um, exalted status as a woman far above her community. Accepting his proposal radiantly, she says, if that's the truth, I'll be burning candles from this out to the miracles of God that have brought you from the South today, and I with my gowns bought ready the way that I can wed you and not wait at all. Now, it is unclear exactly who's paying for these gowns she's going to wed in, but it seems very likely to be Sean. <laughs> now, again, Singh makes us see that the love that Christie and Pegin share is partly narcissistic, yes, but it is also directed at one another, or at least at the idea they hold of one another, an idea of one another that we've begun to see is to a large degree genuine. Despite Christie's exaggerations and despite his lies, there is something fundamentally heroic and poetic in him, as we shall see. Well, their shared love seems then to authenticate them, to make their ideas of one another and of each other true. Pegin says, and to think it's me is talking sweetly now. Christie Mahone and I, the fright of seven townlands for my biting tongue, well, the heart's a wonder, and I'm thinking there won't be our like in Mayo for gallant lovers from this hour today. There won't be anyone like us in County Mayo. We are special, and um, I had been known as a fright of seven towns uh, because I was so uh, prickly and resistant at times, but now, now you have revealed to me my own inner sweetness. Um, the sense of self-discovery, in short, comes about only through a kind of self-idealization and role-playing. Role-playing becomes a form of self-discovery here, in short, in a way it never does in Oscar Wilde. Well, why at this point of Christie's greatest ascendancy does Michael initially refuse to sanction the engagement of his daughter and this individual whom he has celebrated? And why does he now insist that Pegin should marry Sean, a man for whom Michael has no respect at all. Well, it's partly greed. Christie may be a hero, but he has no money. And Sean, who is the richest fellow in the area, offers Michael a herd of cows. But Michael might also hesitate for a less mercenary reason. He may hesitate, I think, because he is, after all, a father himself, and he fears Christie a bit as a prospective son-in-law, even as he approves as Christie's assault on authority figures in the abstract upon Christie's own father, nonetheless, the idea that he is a father himself and that he would be a kind of father or father-in-law to Christie gives him pause. He says, quote, it's father's slay and he's bred to. Hmm. And thus, there's a kind of inborn fear here when the prospect of actually uniting him Christie to his daughter seems imminent. To settle the matter then, Michael urges Sean to fight Christie for Pegine's hand, and Sean predictably flees in terror, leaving Michael the choice then, either of fighting Christie himself or of blessing the union of 
Pegin and Christie, which he does then with gusto um, as he joins their hands and explains it this way. He says, it may be the will of God that we should rear up lengthy families to nurture the earth, and you're more likely to nurture sons than Sean. He says, it's many would be dread to bring your like into their house for to end them, maybe, with a sudden end. Yeah, you are a father killer. I'm a father. But I'm a decent man of Ireland, and I'd liefer face the grave untimely, and I see in a score of grandsons growing up little gallant swearers by the name of God, than go people in my bedside with puny weeds the like of what ye'd breed, Sean. I'm thinking out loud, Sean Keogh. And so he joins the hands of Christy and Pegin. A darling fellow, he says, looking at Christy, a darling fellow is the jewel of the world. Now, at this point, old Mahan makes his third appearance. And Christy's greatest moment of triumph even greater than when he had just returned triumphant from uh, the games, now becomes a moment of acute humiliation, all the more humiliating because it now agonizingly unfolds before Pegin as well as the assembled crowd. Old Mahan rushes in, followed by all the crowd and the widow Quinn. He makes a rush at Christie, knocks him down, and begins to beat him. Pegin, seeing this, glares at Christie and says, And it's lies you told, letting on you had him sitted, slitted, and you nothing at all. Christie, catching Mahan's stick, He's not my father, he's a raving maniac, what would scare the world. But they all know that this is not the case. Pegin, in particular, glaring at him, she says, is there your treachery in spurring me till I'm hard set to think you're the one I'm after lacing in my heartstrings half an hour ago? How could you deceive me this way? How could I have fallen in love with someone like you? And Christie then observes, um, what is it that drives you to torment me here? when I ask the thunders of the might of God to blast me, if I ever did hurt or say any, hurt any, save and only with that one blow, to which Mahan now loudly answers, if you didn't, you're a poor good for nothing, and isn't it by the like of you, the sins of the whole world are committed? Christie raising his hands in the name of the Almighty, to which Mahan says, leave trouble in the Lord God. <laughs> Don't invoke God. He's not going to help you here. Now, why is Pegin's reaction so extreme, so vitriolic in her denunciation when she sees that the old man is alive? Well, it's because if Christie has lied about himself as a father killer, despite all of his poetic language uh, to describe her and despite his pro heroic performances in the games, if he has lied about killing his father, then she can't trust those claims that he has made in praise of her. If he is a liar in any respect, then in some ways uh, it um, completely dissolves her capacity to believe in him as an object of desire or as a kind of mirror who reflects her idea of herself. Now, both Pegin's idea of Christie and her ideal conception of herself that he had confirmed through his gaze and through his words are then now shattered in a single moment of revelation in which he has shown to be untrustworthy, dishonest. Christie doesn't understand the depth of Pegin's rage or aggression, so he tries to woo her again with the poetic language that she loves uh, by praising her anger now. Remember that after she had come in and seen him with the widow Quinn and the girls, he had used this language and he had coaxed her back um, to, uh, to uh, uh, loving him. But now it doesn't work. Um, if only he can appeal to her narcissism, he seems to assume, perhaps again um, she will um, return to him and that that flattery will um, override 
um, her discovery that, in fact, unknowingly, um, he had lied when he said he killed his father. Thus, he says, seeing her anger, there's torment in the splendor of her like, and she a girl any moon on midnight would take pride to meet, facing southwards on the heaths of Keel. But what did I want crawling forward to scorch my understanding at her flaming brow? Casting Pegin as a kind of um, exalted, powerful, fiery beauty now, um, who uh, men should grovel before, it doesn't work. Pegin now, looking at Mahan vehemently, fearing she'll break into tears, says to the old man, take him on from this or I'll set the young lads to destroy him here. Get this wretch out of here, old man, or I will turn the locals on him to do it themselves. Now, Pegin, of course, is mistaken about one thing here. She erroneously assumes that Christie really knew from the beginning that his father was alive. And so she feels so betrayed by what she sees as a compound lie from the start that makes him dishonest about everything else that she wants to destroy Christie. In fact, later when he is bound, she burns his leg with a piece of turf in order to punish him. But Christ, it's clear that Pegin is also struggling with herself here because Christie's lyrical praise has been for her like a kind of narcotic, and she would like to believe that she really is that figure of tormented splendor and fiery indignation, all the more beautiful in her anger that he describes. But she can't embrace it. She can't quite believe it. When Christie appeals to the widow Quinn to help him, to protect him, quite reasonably, she says, I've tried. There's no more I can do. Well, the community now turns against Christie. This community that has up until now uh, increasingly celebrated and embraced him. Why do they turn against him? Well, the crowd has celebrated him and reviled him now because they too feel betrayed for their earlier investment of faith. Um, they saw him as a kind of transgressive idol and now he is a fraud but they become even more disillusioned and hostile when Christie becomes so desperate that he tries to make his original claim true. That is, he turns on his father, chases him outside, denounces him, and attacks the old man with a spade as he'd done before in the scene that I asked you to watch. Now, Christie once again believes, and again mistakenly, that he has killed his father. This time he believes for sure, and he again feels no remorse for the killing, only pride and the deluded expectation that after this, following through on what he thought he'd done before, after this, quote, Pegin will wed me surely. Well, we do not see the altercation uh, between uh, Christie and his father outside in which he strikes him again with the Lloyd. We do not see that on stage, but the villagers and Pegin do see it. And there they find that they are horrified at viewing at close range, close up, what they had glamorized and imagined from a distance as heroic. Like the widow Quinn's killing of her husband, this killing or this attack is too close, too brutal, too gross, too bloody. Now, this gets at the second reason, I think, why they turn against Christie. Uh, and it's not just the sense of being betrayed by their former investment of uh, glamorized faith. Rather, it is summed up after they see him smash his father in the head again in what Pegin says when she comes back in. I'll say, a strange man is a marvel with his mighty talk, but what's a squabble in your backyard and the blow of a loy have taught me that there's a great gap between a gala story and a dirty deed. Seeing Christie assault an old man at close range reveals that it's not a gallant deed, but a dirty one, one that makes the people feel afraid of him, Christie, 
but also a gesture, this violence, that makes them feel guilty for the support that they had given him earlier when they see what it looks like to have your head bashed by a spade. And the community's guilt accounts for the way that they turn on him now, pulling Christie to the floor, along with Pegin as one of the leaders. Um, they plan to notify the police, the same police from whom they had earlier tried to hide Christie. Well, by sacrificing Christie to the authorities, these authorities that they hate, the community is projecting their own guilt for their own violent desires and for their support of Christie's violence onto Christie now as a scapegoat. In fact, scapegoat rituals are common among primitive isolated tribes like the one in this play. And Singh is showing us, I think, this right very clearly. Ironically, though, the irrational villagers who would like to kill Christie in order to displace or negate their own guilt for supporting and celebrating his homicidal violence, now that they have seen it enacted, these same individuals who want to in some way make their own guilt disappear by casting it onto him and making him disappear, by doing so are replicating the very violent crime that they want to punish and deny in themselves by now channeling their violence onto him to tie him down and to send him away. Michael and Pegin lead the way in this because they feel the most betrayed and thus the most guilty. As they peer in at Christy Michael with a rope says, look at the way he is, twist a hangman's knot in it and slip it over his head while he's not minding at all. There's also a threat that uh, even before the police arrive, they might actually try to lynch him. That's how furious they are. Pegin says, come, come, on so. She goes forward with the others and they drop the double hitch over Christie's head. Yes, then Sean says, come on to the peelers till they stretch him out. Yes, let's torture him until the police get there. And indeed, um, Sean burns Christie with turf as well. Now, shortly before this happens, shortly before uh, they come in and Christie is uh, tied up with um, a rope around his neck and um, immobilized. You remember he had staggered back into the pub alone after striking his father the second time, thinking he had killed him. And in a brief scene, the widow Quinn and the three young girls come in and in order to try to get Christy to escape, the widow Quinn at this point uh, acting generously to protect him because it's clear he's not gonna be able to stay in the community at all. Um, so in order to protect him and allow him to get away, they suggest dressing him as a woman and then spiriting him away before the police arrive or before the community can do any damage to him. But now, Christie resists this feminizing, something to which he'd earlier been drawn in himself, so that when they try to fasten a petticoat on him so that he'll appear a woman and he can escape, he breaks away from them defiantly. And here, Christie utters the words in his celebration of Pegin. He utters those words that in Act Three triggered the riot at the Abbey Theater during the play's first performance. Because now again, celebrating Pegin, he uses that forbidden word, shifts. When the widow Quinn suggests, I'll find you finer sweethearts at each waning moon, uh, that, you know, get out of here. There, there are other women whom, you know, you'll discover. Don't, uh, don't stay here and endanger yourself because of your love for Pegin. Christie then says, no, it's Pegin I'm seeking only. And what did I care if you brought me a drift of chosen females standing in their shifts itself, maybe from this place to the Eastern world? Well, um, the middle class Catholic audience in Dublin, as I noted, object to the word shifts because they regarded it as immodest in itself, referring to a woman's undergarment and the image of uh, various women um, appearing before him in their undergarments. But they also objected because they saw it as a profanation of pure Irish womanhood. 
Now, Christie's words surrounding this forbidden term are not only a declaration, again, of his love for Peguin, but they're his most impassioned celebration of her uniqueness and grandeur among women. You could bring me the most chosen females from the Eastern world or any part of the world, and they would not rival Peguin. Notably, however, Peguin doesn't hear this. She's not present for this. And if she had been, it's most likely that even this most seductive of language um, would not have moved her because she would not have believed it since um, at this point uh, it, it seems uh, that Christie has been completely discredited in her eyes. Instead then, when she comes in, as we have seen a moment later, she participates in putting a rope around his neck and in burning his leg with turf as Sean looks on and helps her and calls Christie a mad dog. At this pivotal moment, when this dark comedy seems headed for tragedy, two events occur almost simultaneously to alter the tone somewhat. First, Christy tries to break free from his confinement in the rope, just as, at the same time, his father enters yet again. This reappearance produces the play's most stunning and ironic reversal and it produces a denouement that is both triumphant and heartbreaking. Consider the end of the play. <clears throat> Jimmy looks out the window and says, Will you look what's come in? They all drop Christy, tied up in ropes, and run left. Christy, scrambling on his knees face to face with old Mahan. Are you coming to be killed a third time, Christy asks, or what ails you now? Mahan is like Svengali, uh, 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 not Svengali, um, Rasputin. He seems <laughs> to be capable of coming back any number of times. Um, Mahan says, <clears throat> for what is it they have you tied up? Christie says, they're taking me to the peelers to have me hanged for slaying you. Michael apologetically, it is the will of God that all should guard their little cabins from the treachery of law, and, and what would my daughter be doing if I, if I was ruined or was hanged itself? Mahan grimly, loosening Christy from the rope. It's little I care if you put a bag on her back and went picking cockles till the hour of death, but my son and myself will be going on our own way, and we'll have great times from this out telling stories the villainy of Mayo and the fools is here then to Christie, who is now freed, both by his efforts first and then the father untying him. Go on now, I'm saying. Mahan. <clears throat> uh, go on now. Christie. Go with you, is it? I will then, like a gallant captain with his heathen slave. Go on now, and I'll see you from this day strewing my oatmeal and washing my spuds, for I am master of all fights from now on, pushing Mahan. Go on now, I'm saying. Mahan, is it me? Christy, not a word of you. Go on from this. Mahan, walking out and looking back at Christy over his shoulder. Glory be to God, with a broad smile. I'm crazy again, to which Christy observes. Ten thousand blessings upon all that's here, for you've turned me a likely gaffer in the end of all, the way I'll go romancing with through a rompin' lifetime from this hour to the dawning of the judgment and out he goes. Um, just as Singh had parodied the Magi earlier when the three girls came in bearing gifts, he now um, parodies Christ's resurrection by having Mahone rise from the dead a second time. But consider the subsequent reversals that follow this one and that unfold here in just a few minutes. They're all set in motion by the reversal, as I've suggested, of having this seemingly dead man come back to life. Number one, now after being assaulted a second time, Mahan reverses um, course by respecting his ne'er-do-well son, whom he had earlier derided. He respects Christy, uh, first by suggesting that the two of them will go romancing through the world together, but even more when he bows to Christy's order and says, I'm, in ma I'm the master now, and the father complies. Um, and the irony is, he has now come to respect and obey Christy. Why? Because Christy has tried to kill him twice. Um, note that um, in doing so, um, Christy confirms um, that he has in some ways now authenticated that heroic persona 
in which others believed and in which he had come to believe himself. A persona of an individual who was brave, reckless, dangerous, yet lyrical. This had been what he had performed and now he has acted it out and it has become true. It has been shown to be a fundamental aspect of his nature. Now, you'll note that this is another moment in which um, Singh is playfully riffing, riffing on Freud. Instead of fearing that the father is going to castrate him uh, when and if he rebels, the son now gains the father's respect for rebelling and for trying to kill him. In Singh's inversion of the uh, father-son relationship within the Oedipal rivalry, the son rises up and dominates the father, and the father now happily complies. Yeah. First he respects him, and then he obeys him. They go off together now, father and son, in a new relationship with Christie as the self-declared master and his father, um, all too happy to be his sidekick as they go off to fights in the future. Not with one another, but against the world in a kind of heroic adventure. Another reversal here is the Christie, who had just been cursing the crowd for turning on him and who felt as betrayed by their aggression as they had felt betrayed by his uh, fraudulence. Christie, who has just been denouncing them, uh, now suddenly, as he leaves, says something remarkable. He realizes that it was by first believing in his heroism and then forcing him to make that heroism or that violent uh, uh, rebelliousness in him real by hitting his father again that they have allowed him to discover himself. Now he says, a thousand blessings on all of you because you have allowed me to gain the self-confidence to go romancing through life until Judgment Day. You've given me the confident sense of myself as one who can master anyone, and I never had it before I arrived. Finally, there's this reversal, and this is a sad one. The play ends on a reversal in Pagin. After denouncing Christie as a liar and then as a brute uh, for smashing his father in cold blood before their eyes, now, as he departs, moment after he walks out the door, in her last words in the play and the words that conclude the play, Pagin longs again desperately for Christy. So much that she cries out when Sean says, well, now Father Riley can wed us in the end. After all, she hits him, boxes him on the ear, tells him to get lost and says, quit my sight putting her shawl over her head and breaking out into wild lamentations, keening in agony, she says, Oh, my grief, I've lost him, surely. I've lost the only playboy of the Western world. How can she say this? Because as soon as he's gone and she sees him departing at a distance, at a distance she can re-idealize Christie, and she yearns for him once again as the only man she could ever love after having denounced him. Now, because again, as she herself had said, from a distance, things can look gallant. From a distance, one can reimagine them as one wishes. Distance, excuse me, desire demands idealization, and idealization demands distance. Pegin's lament is poignant, not just because she really has lost the only man worthy of her, but also because um, Christie's absence is one in which it seems she will no longer thereafter be able to sustain belief in her identity as a beautiful, passionate woman, an identity that, like Christie's heroic self, is latent with her, it's latent within her, but could be realized fully only in his presence and through his corroboration. Unlike Christie, she has no future, and she certainly has no future without him. Well, looking back over 100 years, uh, the protests of Singh's morally scru scrupulous audience in the Abbey Theater to this play might seem rather ridiculous to us, but that should not obscure the fact that the Playboy of the, Playboy of the Western World 
is still a disturbing play because it presents a world in which the protagonist can discover himself only by thinking that he killed his father, can exhibit no guilt for it, and can find widespread approval for being a murderer. This is a very dark and subversive human view of human nature. I think especially in a comedy, which is why one of Ireland's most patriotic poets, as I've mentioned, upon seeing this play in 1907, issued this complaint. He said uh, that it's not just that the play is against Ireland. It's not just against Ireland that Singh has blasphemed, but against the moral order of the universe. I'll let you be the judge. Okay, I will uh, be sending you, as you know, your final exam, and I'll be back in touch with you about your papers uh, after you've submitted them to me. I look forward to uh, hearing from all of you about them, and um, more than that, I look forward to seeing you uh, back on campus in September. Be well, okay?